All right. Well, uh, well, thank you. I, I guess I'm the unique speaker to have chosen the option of both in person and um, online talk. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about some work with Domingo Toledo. Uh, and uh, so the basic question we, we started with is you have a, a Lee group, you have a, a lattice in that Lee group, and uh, is it residually finite? So uh, I want to keep some of this elementary for people that haven't seen it all before. So what does it mean to be residually finite? And uh, so that just means for every non-trivial element of your group, there's some finite quotient in which that survives to be non-trivial. It's a very basic property. Um, and so if you've never done this before, we could look at, think about how you would do this for SL2. It's a very basic example. Okay. Um, and uh, so there's an even sort of stronger result building on that, that example due to Malsev, which says that if you have a linearly group, then the answer is yes. In fact, if you have any finitely generated subgroup of GLM, uh, then it's a residually finite. So, so if you have, for instance, an adjoint semi-simple group, then all the lattices inside there are, are residually finite. So, um, and I, I think there, there's some sort of, you know, if you study lattices, there's some naive sense in which you're usually taking a lattice in an adjoint group and it's residually finite, you move on and you maybe miss some of the, the subtleties. So um, I'd like to talk about some of those uh, to start. But first, a bit of motivation, why you might care about residual groups or residual fineness as a property. Um, so first of all, there's a sort of computational, this is totally infeasible, actually. You know, if I give you some finitely presented group, you know, is there a, uh, and I give you some element that's a word in those generators, you know, is, is that element non-trivial? This is actually an unsolvable problem in general, but um, uh, you know you could just start trying to presume, find some finite quotient where, where that survives, um, and it's pretty easy to write down examples where this is just totally infeasible. Such is life. Um, there's a nice topological motivation, which is called the Scott criterion. So if you're if your gamma, your say finitely generated group, is a fundamental group, some manifold that you care about. And then you take some compact subset cover. Um, then the fundamental group is residually finite if and only if there's a finite cover to which that compact set embeds. It's, it's actually an equivalent. Uh, so again, this condition. Um, and so, for instance, when you have uh, sort of self-intersecting geodesics on uh, on a, a Ramanian manifold, residually finite fundamental group, then you can find some finite cover to which that, that geodesic becomes a simple geodesic embedded circle. Um, okay, so that's a so the, the the use of residually finite you know residual finiteness as, as a property and topology is just sort of begins here and keeps going onward and upward and sort of generalizations of residual finiteness played a big role in uh, resolutions of but the important conjectures of three manifold topology that's 20 years or years. Uh, and then from an algebraic geometry perspective, um, there's this, if you have some say, smooth projective variety of the complex numbers, you have its topological fundamental group and you have its total fundamental group. And uh, the point is that the uh, topological fundamental group is residually finite if and only if it embeds in the atal fundamental group. Um, okay, so motivation abound to, to study residual finiteness. And uh, so, uh, the, you know, during the director's remarks, I said that there's supposed to be a little pedagogical element to these. So I do want to try to keep some of this simple for those that haven't seen it. Um, so if you have a league group, then you take its universal cover just as a manifold. And that's again a league group. And the fundamental group of your, your original group is a central subgroup of that universal cover. Um, and so, for, okay, I said it was gonna be simple and now I'm throwing a 
wrong words like a joint, but you know, just think about like PSLNR if you are comfortable with this. Uh, so take an adjoint semi-simple group, then the center of the universal cover will be um, the, the fundamental group of this is K is a maximal. Uh, and you get this exact sequence, central exact sequence. So if I have a lattice inside of G, then I get a central exact sequence, uh, just the same. Um, and so one of my interests recently has been residual finiteness properties of these central. Um, so, you know, wh why would you want to study these groups? So, you know, from a geometric point of view, uh, let's say you have this locally symmetric space, um, gamma mod g mod k, this is a locally symmetric space. I probably should write there. And then you get a bundle over it with fiber k, by just looking at the quotient of g mod gamma. And since G is homotopy equivalent to K, you see that this, this group here is the fundamental group of that bundle. And uh, so this is a sort of important class of manifolds in and of themselves that are bundles over locally symmetric spaces. Uh, there's an arithmetic motivation to this where uh, that I'll, I'll come back to a bit later, so I'll be just vague for now, but um, residual finiteness for these uh, Central extensions is related to existence of certain fractional weight modular forms, automorphic line bundles, um, maybe for some some subgroup, some congruent subgroup, the lattice you care about. Um, and uh, okay, so um, so that's something I'll, I'll touch on again later. But uh, there's also a, a sort of motivation, personal motivation as well, for geometric group theory. Which is if your group is a rank one group, let's say it's you know fundamental group of a compact hyperbolic manifold, um, then sometimes out of this machinery you get some central extensions, some finite central extensions. So uh, I'll talk in a, in a minute about the simple case of PSL two R, where you have the n fold cyclic cover of that group, and that gives you an n fold cyclic central extension. Um, and these are Gromov hyperbolic groups, uh, assuming that the gamma was co compact to start with. And it's a major open problem whether all Gromov hyperbolic groups are residually finite. And uh, so there's maybe some, some modest hope uh, that uh, one could find a counterexample amongst central extensions of right lattices. But, uh, But yeah, like I said, uh, I want to return to just PSL2R and talk about this very classical situation. So, yeah, let's just, for, for a friendly afternoon chat, assume that this gamma is uh, the fundamental group of a closed Riemann surface of genus G. So, this torsion free and nice. Uh, then uh, this is sort of very classically known result that the free image in any connected cover of psl 2 r is um, is uh, residually finite. And maybe the thing to note here is that pi one here is isomorphic to Z integers. So you have an infinite cyclic cover is the universal cover. And why? It's really just the polar decomposition. PSL2R. Right, so the polar decomposition of a two by two matrix tells you that PSL2R is homotopy equivalent to a circle. So it's fundamental group of Z, you get this cyclic cover. Um, and uh, so it's a classic result that this is residually finite. Um, and so what's a sketch of, of how you can do this? The way you can achieve it is by finding a nilpotent quotient of this, uh, this central extension. Okay, so we, we've lifted this to the universal cover group. Um, now I care about any connected cover, so there are all these intermediate finite signatures. It's fine. I'm going to go all the way. And I'm going to find a two step nilpotent quotient that's injective on the center. 
So we have this exact sequence. The one. I'm going to map this onto a notebook group so that the center injects inside. And the point is that no-potent groups are not only residually finite, they're extremely residually finite. And so uh, you can use the fact that, combine the fact that this group is residually finite and the fact that this group is residually finite to put them together to get it for, for the central extension. Maybe to say it out loud, what, what am I going to do if I have an element of this gamma twiddle that I would like to survive in a finite quotient. Well, if it maps non-trivially to gamma, then I use a finite quotient of gamma, and I'm fine. This is already residually finite, so we're good. Right? This is a finitely generated linear group. So that leaves you with just considering elements of the center. Well, so the center then goes into this no-potent group n, and then I use a finite quotient of n. Uh, and the sort of shadow result is that you can actually do the Zeeman n cyclic extensions and make this still work. But, and that, again, this sort of strong residual finiteness of no bone groups um, allows you to get the finite covers as well. So how do you find this nil potent group? Well, one way is you can just do it directly from a presentation. You can write down a presentation for this, this gamma twiddle, this gamma twiddle, fundamental group of the unit tangent bundle. The surface is closed Riemann surface. And you can write down a presentation for this that uh, is just a natural and central extension of the fundamental group of the genus G surface. And then you just write down a map to a notebook. You sort of generalize Heisenberg, just do it. That's okay. Um, there's an equivalent way to think about this from, from algebraic geometry that uh, if you write down the correct nilpotent group, then these are actually one and the same. Uh, so the, the other thing is you can realize this gamma twiddle as the fundamental group of the total space of the canonical bundle for the Riemann surface minus the zero section. So that's a circle bundle over the Riemann surface. So the fundamental group of a circle bundle over the Riemann surface is going to have fundamental group to Z central extension, fundamental group of the surface. And so this particular central extension is. And uh, the point is, you know, you say sort of fancy words like theta divisor, and there's a line bundle on the Jacobian that pulls back to the canonical bundle. Uh, and uh, when is this right here is a null bundle. It's in fact, a two-step notebook. It's a circle bundle of higher dimensional dilemmas. Okay, um, that's that. That's, so that's the sort of introduction to the rank one world. So now we'll go to, to higher rank and uh, and talk about uh, theorem of Deline. So if you take SP2GZ, then Again, this is a Z central extension. So let's say, I don't know, GR is, is Z. And so this is again a Z central extension. And it's not residually. And the point is that uh, the, the sort of key element to the proof of, of this result is the congruent subgroup property. And so it's a very general technique. I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, and the point is that using uh, the, the argument, in fact, computes the intersection of all the finite index subgroups very specifically. So again, just to I'll write this exact sequence for the hundredth time. Um, So again, if I have an element of this group and I want to find a quotient where it survives, if it survives down here, uh, then I can find a finite quotient using the fact that SP2GZ is a, a very, very little. So you really just care about studying elements of the center. 
And uh, the point is that you can in fact show that this, this intersection is uh, two times Z uh, inside the center. Um, and so in fact, for all the finite, for, for every finite cover of SP2GZ, you know exactly whether the pre-image of SP2GZ, SP, sorry, sorry, every finite cover of SP2GR, look at the pre-image of SP2GZ, and the link tells you whether or not that pullback is originally finite, and the double covers. Uh, and so, to uh, this is basically a, the way I'm writing this theorem is basically uh, cribbed from the Prasad Rappenchuk paper on the metaplectic kernel. But so if you have an absolutely simple, simply connected group over a global field with central, <coughs> excuse me, uh, congruent subgroup, congruence kernel, and uh, then you know there's there's some words, but the point is there's an object. Why not have the word? A little thing to circle. There's something. There's something you can compute. Well, for sudden wrapper check can compute it. I can't. Uh, called the absolute metaplectic kernel, where if you look at a cover of this um, this product of of G's over the the S places, uh, if you take a cover of degree larger than the metaplectic kernel, then uh, then it is. Not... Oh, I said it correctly. Then no arithmetic, arithmetic subgroup in a cover of sufficiently high degree is residual. I did say that. Um, good. Oops. Uh, and, uh, and the point is that you know in, in their paper they actually compute this on the nodes. So you know assembling all of this and, and assuming maybe the, the congruent subgroup property is is proved everywhere, this gives you a very very concrete picture in the higher rank case very explicit picture of when you should expect the lift of a lattice and an adjoint group to a covering group to be residually free. You know, maybe for the covers that are smaller than the order of the metaplectic group, you should, you should be a little careful to talk about what happens there, but, you know, generally up to proving the congruent subgroup property for, for the group you have at hand, which um, we can just trust that's okay, uh, you, you really know what's going on, all right? So, so that leaves the rank one picture. Oh, I even wrote it down. So yeah, so assuming the Congress over property, we have a very good understanding. So uh, that leaves us in the rank one case. Um, so it's known for every rank one group that the Congress over property either doesn't for a given lattice, maybe for all lattices, uh, or it's open, whether it's true or false. We believe it's false. Maybe for SP and F4, there's there's some some lack of faith. But, um, so so for the case of hyperbolic space, this is a, a pretty simple situation. So the the universal cover is in fact a linear group in and of itself. So take the lift of the universal cover. Well, Malsev tells you that's that's residually. So the case of hyperbolic manifolds is perhaps not so interesting for this problem. Uh, PUN1 ends up being actually quite interesting because it has fundamental group Z. So its maximal compact subgroup is unitary group. Unitary group has fundamental group Z. And, uh, um, and, and one thing I want to emphasize here is that, you know, not only is this universal cover not linear, you actually know every linear representation factors through SUN1, n plus one fold cover of the adjoint group. So, uh, so you certainly can't use MALSEV to prove, uh, prove that these groups are residual. So that's a, a very wide open case. Um, and uh, I realized in writing this down, um, not actually sure this is true because I was looking at two different sources for the fundamental group. So certainly the fundamental groups of, of PSPN1 and F4 minus 20 or Z2, the adjoint groups. Um, 
but uh, then I, I I think I saw that. So if somebody knows actually if whether or not the you know the double cover of f four minus twenty is, there, I'd love to know because I I think the uh, sources I look at conflicting on fundamental groups. Um, but anyways, ne nevertheless, uh, SPN one the double cover here is definitely linear. So putting this all together, I think the, the key case that you know remains to, to study here is the case of PUN1. This is where we uh, we know the least. So we do know something though. Uh, the question, repete. Uh, so uh, so if you take a co-compact lattice. Congruence co compact lattice of simplest type. If you've never seen that. If if you had to go out and build an arithmetic subgroup of PUN1, this is the one you would probably go and build, um, unless you're really a fan of uh, cyclic division algebras, which actually there are people in the room that, that are. So maybe that joke falls flat on them. But, anyways, um, so these, these are the arithmetic groups you get from permission forms over number of fields. That's just what simplest type means. Um, and then you take the pre-image in any connected cover. So remember the fundamental group is Z. So we have a, a full, uh, for every cyclic group, we have a cyclic cover, including Z. And uh, we proved that the pre-image in any connected cover is, is residually full. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so maybe I'll, I'll say a couple corollaries of that. So again, this, this can be related to fractionally automorphic forms, line bundles, however you want to say it. Um, the point here again is I'll, I'll just say this out loud for people that know now and maybe come back to it later and hopefully fill in some gaps. Um, but the characteristic class, so for the universal cover, the characteristic class is again the canonical bundle, just like it is for for a Riemann surface. And um, finding uh, residual finiteness of this central extension is then related to finding subgroups, it allows you to find subgroups of gamma where the canonical bundle becomes arbitrarily divisible, becomes divisible by n, arbitrarily large n. In fact, our, our, our techniques are strong enough to find a subgroup for every n. So it's divisible by n. Um, and so that, that's all I'll say there for now. Um, and the, the techniques of what we do, I, I mentioned this sort of theta divisor interpretation of the nilpotent quotient one uses for a Riemann surface. Um, and uh, um, uh, what we do actually finds an analog there for these Shimura varieties. Um, but I have to stop for one second because I completely forgot to look and it's on my iPad that I'm using. What time am I supposed to stop? 520. 520, okay, perfect, thank you. <laughs> Things one should know when giving a talk. Um, their theorems and when to stop. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. So so I'll maybe get into this a little bit. Um, so the method that we use is actually to generalize the proof that works for, for PSL to R. Now in the PSL to R case, you don't need any sort of congruence assumptions. This is all very concrete and hands on, just sort of go about your business. But um, you know, really our goal in, in trying to prove this theorem was, was to, to imitate what one can do for the Riemann surface set. And so what we actually do, and, and this is essentially what, Richard Hill does as well. I forgot to say it. It was on the theorem statement that was independently and almost concurrently proved by Richard Hill. Um, previous result. So for these gamma that are congruence of simplest type, co-compact, there's a finite index subgroup and a homomorphism from this universal, from, not universal, from this z-central extension onto a two-step notebook group that's injective on the center. Okay. And so, so this gives you, gives you for, uh, 
three images. Try covers. Exactly as for real spaces. Okay. So now I want to uh, maybe describe a little bit how we do that. How do we find this no bone? I, uh, as you all can imagine, this is a bit hastily thrown together. It's going to give a chalk talk, but here we are. Uh, okay. And uh, the other remark is that uh, this gamma prime that you choose can be a congruence. So you can you can find this sort of magic gamma prime with a two-step notebook motion, staying within the realm of congruence. Uh, so there are two steps to, to doing this. Um, and so the, the method is, is an idea that I think it's been well worn in a few different places, but uh, I certainly know of it from a paper of Sullivan in the seventies. So, um, so we have a Z central extension. So we get an element of H two of gamma Z of the central extension. Uh, it's a characteristic class of, of this. Um, and if that characteristic class is in the image of the cup product map, then you can find the two-step notebook function. That's there. Um, maybe if I have a little time at the end, I could say a few words about this. The direction we need, this is actually an if and only if statement. Um, there's a two-step notebook and quotient that's injective on the center, if and only if it's in the image of the cup product. Uh, the direction we need is the easy direction, and it's, um, it's just a sort of k pi one argument. The fact that it's a k pi one argument using a torus, a map to a torus, is what allows you to get this uh, pullback of a line bundle from the Albanese data device uh, corollary. So that's that right there. Um, so so right. So so the 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 proof has two steps. The first step um, uses the magic words of theta correspondence. Um, so we sort of followed very closely with, with no innovations. We just had to check that their methods worked in the case uh, we cared about. So Bergeron, Milson, and Moblen, when they proved the Hodge conjecture for these, these same types of varieties, um, they proved uh, some structural results that allowed us to conclude that, um, so this is just to start, we'll just take some general element of H2 gamma Z. This is an aspherical space, so this is H2 of the locally symmetric space as well. So this is arbitrary to start. So this arbitrary element is in the image of the cut product from H1 um, when some conditions hold. So if n is greater than or equal to four, then everything is virtually in the range of k. This is again, this is the this is the pass to the congruence subgroup. Okay. So everything is virtually in the image. Uh, if n is greater than or equal to four, you're just it's always true. It's always in the image. That is three, then every H11 class is. So you just take the Hodge decomposition for this, this quotient. And in the n equals two case, you need it to be in the span of the total geodesic space. So inside of this, uh, this is now four manifold, complex two manifold. You have totally geodesic Riemann surfaces, complex uh, curves. Um, so that uh, and so everything that's in that span is in the image of the cup product. Okay. So using this method of uh, you get this two-step nilpotent group for everything that falls in under this um, these assumptions, right? And now the point is, we actually cared about a particular central extension. We cared about the one coming from the universal cover. And uh, the point is, using what one calls Kudla-Milson theory, um, so the, the characteristic class you get for this infinite cyclic cover 
is the first churn class of the, the complex manifold of the locally symmetric space. Uh, and it is in the span of the total GNC space. And uh, the point there is that this kudla milson theory gives you a, um, out of a, a two form, you build something that ends up being a uh, modular form of some weight for a product of hyperbolic planes. Uh, the point is that if this first term class wasn't in the span of the totally geodesic cycles, then uh, the kudla milson form would be, on the one hand, uh, a higher weight modular form for something, uh, but on the other hand, it ends up being a constant. So you need to subtract away the projection. But the, the key point is it's a really cute, very slick argument that just says you can essentially build a kudla milson form that's higher weight and also a constant function. It's just nonsense. Um, really pretty argument um, that is in a, another paper of Bergeron et al. Um, it's not, not an original idea to us. We've learned that from paper one. Uh, so um, the, the point is we actually end up proving a more general theorem, right? Because we know that uh, under all these assumptions, we can actually, um, so these are just the above assumptions written again, uh, that any Z central extension is, is residually finite for, for uh, uh, any class you want. So if you're in PUN1 for n grand equal to four, you take congruence arithmetic lattice, simplest type, you take any Z central extension of that, it's residually finite. When n equals two and three, we have these added hypotheses that allow us to use the, the theta correspondence technology. Um, but uh, such is life. Um, so that's sort of our main strongest result. Um, I want, do want to mention an application of this though, uh, that comes maybe a little out of the blue, but uh, quite like it. So, Using this this previous theorem that I just uh, just walked past, you can show that for all n grand equal to two, there are smooth projective varieties that meet a Kähler metric of negative curvature that aren't homotopy equivalent to any locally symmetric space. Uh, now, if you've never thought about this problem, you would think maybe this is this should have been known from from ancient times. Um, of course, for n equals one, so what n? What is n? dimension um, and so for n equals one of every Riemann surface by uniformization actually admits as long as it's genus at least two admits a, a metric of negative curvature so it's this statement is false for real surfaces um, but uh, there's actually kind of a thin record previously so famously uh, Mostow and Sue built examples for n equals two, and, and Zheng built upon their examples with some more. Uh, and for n equals three, Martin de Rowe and his thesis built. So new examples, again, using similar ideas, and ours are also similar. We're not, we're not uh, really going outside of the box of these examples um, built before, but uh, the point is there was only a finite list of examples that had been, that had been built previously. Um, and ours is very general. So maybe I'll, I'll just come back, come back to this later. A little bit of time. But uh, so the point is you build uh, branch covers of these ball quotients. Uh, branched over some totally geodesic device. So you have to prove that those have been a Kähler metric of negative curvature. That essentially goes back to the Moss Sioux paper. <coughs> As Yang wrote it down in, in the higher dimensional case. Um, 
And so the sort of unknown step is the existence of non-trivial branch colors. And so since I have the time, maybe I'll, I'll say a word about that in a second. Um, so we're done. So if you have your, this is just true for aspherical manifold in general, make it blue. This may not be connected, but let's assume we have some D inside. So this is a co-dimension two manifold. This is a real co-dimension two. That's made up. of some disjoint union of some totally geodesic subspaces, my locally symmetric space. And the point is you can build a default branch cover F and only F. Homology class is divisible by D. I don't know why this is getting so uh, shaky. Okay. Um, and so for this to be divisible by D, so what, what's the sort of picture that goes on? So we have this class. I can't spell. And um, with this central extension, so then you can find cover. Why is this so strange? Uh, so that D is going to pi minus uh, if the uh, restriction the scale prime of uh, the ID. Visible by D. And you can do this if this extension is residual. So that's the little exercise to think through. Um, and so um, and what things are in the span of the totally geodesic divisors, but the totally geodesic divisors. So our theorem certainly holds for these, these classes. So you can get residually finite, residual finiteness of these central extensions. And in fact, as I said, you actually get residual residual finiteness of all of the Z mod D extensions. D. Uh, so you can in fact pick the D that you want. And this, this becomes a very robust construction. And uh, um, so that's, is that. Um, so that's sort of where our theorem is coming to the finally answer that uh, old open problem. Um, and uh, I, I want to mention a couple um, final questions, and then I'll make a couple other remarks, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be done. Um, so uh, Uh, 
sort of oddly, you know, in, most times in the study of arithmetic groups, it's the non-uniform ones that are the easiest. Um, we actually don't prove residual finiteness for uh, essential extensions of the non-uniform lattices. And the, the point is that, you know, our argument is this argument from algebraic topology about circle bundles over compact manifolds. Uh, and so I, 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 I think this is certainly within reach. Um, uh, in, a, in a different paper, we did actually check for a couple of Picard modular groups. This is, is that, it's two. Uh, so we did check in, in a couple examples where we could actually we actually found a nil potent quotient by hand. Um, but uh, so that that's definitely an open case. Um, and uh, also a you know place where one maybe could just go to the computer since there's only finitely many of these, but I certainly was not uh, not successful myself. Um, you know, a non-arithmetic lattice, our, our results also don't say much. Um, but the, the case that, you know, I think uh, maybe to, to some of this audience that I, I think is most interesting, um, and I did try to think about this quite hard, is, is a fake projective plane. So to be specific, you know, gamma, PU21, I want a fake projective plane. You know, twiddle is the inverse image and the inverse cover. And you know, from a concrete algebraic uh, geometry perspective, this is pi one of um, the canonical bundle minus the zero section. Uh, you can actually prove that the, the canonical bundle minus the zero section, this is a rational homology flat sphere. It's homotopy equivalent to a rational homology flat sphere. The associated circle bundle, you need to contract. Deformation retracting on this. Um, so this is some, ra some rational homology sphere whose fundamental group I cannot prove is. In fact, uh, I did mess about with these quite a bit. There are nice presentations for these given by Kurt Steger. Um, if you look in my first paper with Domingo, we sort of describe a way in which one can derive a presentation for any central extension of a lattice in PUN1, basically using the winding number projection onto the um, UN factor. And so I, I wrote down a couple of presentations and went to the computer and I just sort of utterly failed to prove. I think I went with a Zmod 5 central extension, um, so just for a finite one. But uh, it's all to say, I, I certainly from a computational perspective, I had no luck. From a theoretical perspective, I had no luck. But maybe maybe some, somebody else out there can do a little better than me. Um, but anyways, I, I think that's be an interesting case to settle. Um, and I want to add uh, one more thing because I have the time. Um, Uh, so, so general central extensions, I mean, so this even becomes interesting I think for two separate crowds. Um, so for both PO, PON1 and, and in higher rank, I think this, this becomes a little interesting. Um, you know, maybe, uh, Something like Matsushima vanishing will tell you that in, for certain higher rank groups, you're only looking at finite central extensions, but those are still like, very interesting. In fact, I was mentioning a uh, somewhat recent theorem of Richard Hill, which says that for um, So you want your gamma to, to satisfy the usual assumptions one does in congruent subgroup property land, you have absolutely almost simple, simply connected group. 
last name of the Congress Silver property. Um, and there exists an abelian group A. and a central extension. It's not residually finite. Okay, um, so even in the cases where the lift to the universal cover is a residually finite group, you can find some other extension by an abelian group so that it's not. And I maybe had to pass to a separate example. Probably have to pass to a subgroup again. <coughs> um, especially if this is, this is a perfect group, that's not going to work. Um, and uh, in the um, the P O N one setting, which one was? Um, gamma simplest type. Is good in the sense of Sayer. So, this don't sorry. Uh, and so you can actually prove using that that um, any. Extension of gamma by any finitely generated residually finite the sterile is residually finite. Okay, so you have a, you have a very strong converse state uh, there. But um, even for the other arithmetic constructions, I have no idea. Uh, Equal three by the work of many people combinating with Eagle of all can fit the three one go. So you get the same conclusion in the three dimension case. Um, but uh, but yeah, so in, I think in both of those worlds there's some some interesting problems uh, to attack as well. Um, and uh, oh, maybe I'll ask one last question. So Domingo and I, you you can take take the um, Masa Su examples as well, but. Uh, uh, are the fundamental groups of these residually fine? And sort of circling way back to one of my motivations from geometric group theory, uh, it's an open problem whether all hyperbolic groups are residually finite. These are you now torsion free um, Gromov hyperbolic groups. We actually don't know whether these are residually finite groups. Um, so, so, yeah, I think uh, I, will, I will wrap up on that. It's like there's, there's much to do. So it was some young person in the audience will go solve this tonight. Anyways, thank you. Some questions, comments? Hi. Um, I wanted to ask if you had some information about this Neil Putin group N that you found as a quotient. Do you know what it looks like? Um, yes, actually, the, the, the point is, uh, no, you, you can be very explicit here. Uh, the point is what you're going to do is, so we, okay, so you need to know, no, no, you don't even need to know that. Uh, so we have that this element is in the image of the cut product. Uh, so the cut product evaluation, so, I'm gonna, so CQ for me is the cut product evaluation map. Uh, 
So what does that tell you? That tells you if you take um, this sort of universal map from your space to the torus, it comes from the abelianization. So the world of projective varieties is the Albanese map. This is telling you that this class is a pullback. Right, so you just look at the map on the cohomology, the fact that the cohomology of the torus is, is generated by uh, the cut product of, of things from H1. This is sort of pretty immediate algebraic topology. Uh, and so what's my nilpotent group? It's that, it's the one that I, it's the extension of the fundamental group of the torus given by that class. That's it. Some other Thanks. questions? Yes. Other questions, comments? Yes, Peter. Yeah, I get this to work. Okay. In some of these cases where you don't, you're not sure yet whether some of these cyclic covers are residually finite, is there a reason to think that you're, if they are, you could demonstrate that via a nilpotent quotient? My guess would be no. So for instance, for these fake projective plane groups, um, you might expect that so it's known for all the congruent subgroups, the first Betty number is trivial. And so every infinite nilpotent group has, has an infinite cyclic quotient. And so this is not going to happen. So you're not going to find, so the, the strict statement of Domingo and I prove will not be true for this. You can't find a congruent subgroup with the two step infinite two step. Um, and uh, for the non arithmetic ones, it, it may still work. But, um, but for the, the cases I care about the most, I think a genuinely new idea. Other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, oh. So what do you know about the fundamental group of fake projective plane? You know, uh, sometimes they can be lifted to SU to one when the uh, line bundle is divisible by three, but uh, over that, do we know much? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think, um, I think, I think we also do know that it's not divisible by D for any D not equal to three. Uh, there are some examples. But uh, yeah, so, so the fact that some of these fake projective planes lift to SU21, is equivalent to the fact that this uh, that the canonical bundle is divisible by yeah. uh, sorry canonical line bundle is divisible by three in Picard group yeah um, and I, I think it's either it's either indivisible or it's only divisible by three um, whether you could pass to a subgroup where it becomes divisible by two let's say to lift to the double cover I I don't know a single example. No, I, I know nothing beyond what's in your paper. What, what did you say? No, I, I couldn't follow it. Yeah, I, I, all, all I know is is what's in your paper. There are the cases where it's divisible by three, and I know no other divisibility, general divisibility properties. Yeah, okay. Um, Thank you. On subgroups of finite index. Okay, let us... Thank Matthew again and wish him quick recovery. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you all from my balcony.